Again, if you'll have your uh, Bibles open to John chapter 20, we're coming back to the passage we began to look at yesterday. And as you're opening them, I just say a special thank you to Natalie, that amazing preparation for our hearts and the beautiful hymn that uh, Graham chose for us. So, um, we remember that yesterday we began to look at Thomas and his almost final encounter with Jesus here in John chapter 20. And so we're going to read the passage once again and dive in to conclude it. Verses 19 to 31. When therefore it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples therefore rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus therefore said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. But Thomas, Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples, therefore, were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I shall see his hands, in his hands the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Reach here your finger and see my hands. Reach here your hand and put it into my side. And be not unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see, and yet believed. Many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But, I have, but these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. You remember that yesterday we gave our full attention <clears throat> to the idea of warnings along the way in the journey of discipleship which this account first alerts us to. We cannot read this honestly without taking note of some warnings about levels of unbelief. <laughs> But now this morning we want to come back to it and now see how it moreover is meant to offer actually huge encouragement for humble and sincere questioners, doubters, even skeptics before it then culminates in a powerful and conclusive Christ-centered climax. If you or me, like Thomas have doubts or fears or really serious questions, even some honest skepticism with regard to Jesus. The first note of real encouragement comes to us in this passage in verse 26. If you'll look at that closely with me, in our church with Muslim peoples, we constantly are saying, put your finger in the text, see it yourself. Verse 26, wherein Jesus again visits the disciples, both materially and supernaturally, with really serious post-resurrection importance about how sin is dealt with. 
But you note how this time it deliberately specifies that Thomas is with them, verse 26, as opposed to what we read back in verse 24, Thomas was not with them. And Jesus reiterates his gift of peace, or as we shall see, the broader significance of shalom. After eight days, we read again, his disciples were inside and Thomas with them. Do you note the change? Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Jesus had offered this same gift in his first appearance back in verse 21. Not just because the disciples are still fearful, shut up and locked up, yet again in the house they have escaped to, but also, I think, precisely for the sake of Thomas, who is now with them. So that Thomas, too, is included in Jesus' <coughs> offer of the gift of peace. It is not just a cozy, lovely feeling, but it is a reine, the New Testament equivalent of the Hebrew shalom. Literally everywhere a reine appears in the New Testament, not partially, but literally every occurrence of it, it is a rendition of shalom from the Hebrew. Meaning, what I call full-orbed wholeness. Don't you want to be whole? Wholeness in all the most significant and critical relationships in Hebraic thought, including, first of all, a living relationship with God through Jesus Christ, the Prince of Shalom according to Isaiah, and including loving and forgiving relationships with people and distant or distinct cultural groupings and even nations around you, and including in Hebraic thought, very importantly, a healthy relationship with Yourself, inner equilibrium, and in Hebrew thought, even a balanced relationship with the created material world around you. That is the peace, the shalom Jesus gifts to us here after the resurrection the beginning of a new creation experience, shalom, is now available because the cross has accomplished it. And you can easily see, if you stop to think about it and understand how this is particularly relevant for the humble questioner. For the humble skeptic, the humble doubter, in that this biblical provision of shalom, if we take Hebrew thought seriously, is about wholeness in every aspect, including mental consistency intellectual credibility and a level of rational cohesiveness that doubters must address, that honest thinkers have to say, wait a minute, what about this? What about that? And the peace of Jesus, the shalom, the Hebrew wholeness includes the rational explanation that gives you a sense as this is 
worth my belief, my faith, my trust. Not absolutely, but enough to step into growing faith, advancing faith. This biblical provision of shalom includes that rational cohesiveness that is happy to actually say to you, your questions, your doubts, even skeptical analysis are not suspect, but welcome by Christ. Because God wants you whole and wholly engaged including your very good, very real, very honest questions addressing your deepest doubts or fears. And that leads me to address one of the questions that came to me. Thank you so much. There's a slew of really good questions, but two or three of them all had a similar theme that I thought was pertinent right here. Basically asking the question, if, if you're not raised in a Christian home, would you actually be a Christian at all? So how do you know if your faith is actually genuine if you're raised in a Christian home where it's just become passed on? I've had that discussion with some of my children. <clears throat> One in particular. <laughs> it's a really, really good question. And would you be a Christian if you were not raised in a Christian home or Christian culture, <laughs> a Christian country, which don't, doesn't exist? I would argue to answer, I think, to say you would not be a Christian if you're not raised in a Christian home is not actually cohesive. I have many friends from deeply different cultures called Islam who are embracing Jesus because they've taken the time to look at the evidence, to read the Bible as over opposed to the Quran, to ask difficult questions, and they are convinced, staking their life on escaping a country so they can pursue Christianity. So I propose you think about that. Obviously it's a difficult question because of really distant cultures where any opportunity to hear about Jesus is difficult, but we could talk about that one-on-one. -on -one. Come to me, those that raise that question. I'll come back to say something more about that near the end. God wants you whole, engaged, even your deepest questions that I think will lead you, I know will lead you because the Holy Spirit promised to lead you into all, all the truth. We go on then to the second note of real encouragement in this passage, that Jesus is not at all, aren't you so happy to see in this story, Jesus is not at all recalcitrant in providing deeper evidence, as Thomas requires and even demands. We see this most clearly when we note a purposeful comparison that is set up in the narrative flow of this passage. For back in verse 20, so go now, back now to verse 20, John is intentionally specific when he records that Jesus specifically showed them both his hands and his side. Do you see that in verse 20? He showed them. But here in verse 27, with Thomas himself, individually and personally, Jesus does not hesitate to provide the more empirical evidence 
that Thomas seems to require in order to appease his real questions and lingering doubts. It is tangible, even tactile. Reach here your finger, Jesus says. See my hands. Reach here your hand and put it in my side. He doesn't just show them to Thomas. He says, touch me. See me. Put your hands in the nail prints. Put your hand in my side where the spear pierced me through. I think we find here in John's account such a strange and wonderful mix of the very material and the utterly supernatural put together. That if nothing else would undoubtedly tug at the mind strings, if not the heart strings, of even the most ardent rationalist or the most sincere skeptic. It is, I like to say, happily anti-docetic. You can take that and impress your friends. Happily anti-docetic. So important to any empirical thinker. That is to say, addressing that early heresy termed docetism or docetism, which decried and actually denied Jesus in real flesh and blood and bone, especially in terms of crucifixion and resurrection, offering that he only appeared to be human. Docetism said Jesus was not a real man. He couldn't have suffered like that. He was divine entirely. Whereas incarnation requires that we see in Jesus the full humanness as well as divinity. Here, Jesus himself offers his scarred body as evidence of a real, though supernaturally accomplished, fleshly, resurrected body. It is also verifiably supernatural in that Jesus all but quotes Thomas, doesn't he? He all but quotes Thomas's earlier condition for belief in verse 25, even though he, Jesus, was not present at all at this point in the narrative. There's a supernatural awareness. And again, to affirm the supernatural setting, verse 26 narrates how Jesus came through. Not just shut doors, but actually locked doors. Doors. That is the real sense of the Greek perfect tense, kekleismenon, locked doors. Not just shut, but this word would have been used by the, the readers of Jesus' day to say kekleismenon is, uh, is a uh, perfect tense that really is getting at its locked. To say something supernatural happened here, experience. And all of that leads, as is easily experienced in the retelling of this story, to what can only be described as a powerfully conclusive, Christ-centered climax. In the closing verses of the narrative, read them with me. Verse 28 and 29, Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. It ends ultimately with Jesus' own assessment as to the more significant blessedness associated with faith. As put up alongside the necessary limits of evidence. As he is unswerving 
and sweepingly categorical, what Kierkegaard referred to as the leap of faith, when he concludes it all absolutely categorically, blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. But even this, of course, is prefaced by the incredible turnaround in Thomas himself that cannot be contained to the easiness, mundaneness of inner reflection or mild interest. No, rather, it cannot help but erupt in what is now widely regarded as one of the most heartfelt but equally theologically astute Christological confessions, affirmations in all of the Bible coming from this one who was so doubtful, so skeptical. My Lord and my God. This huge confession affirms Jesus' authority, my Lord. This huge confession affirms Jesus' divinity, my God. And it makes it rightly evangelical. That is to say, we believe in a personal encounter with God. My Lord, my God. There are various things within our evangelical tradition which we oughtly, rightly ought to critique. But one of the hallmarks that I am so happy to proclaim wherever we go is we believe in a personal, personal, personal encounter with Jesus Christ. My Lord. My God. Have you come to that? Even though you're at Chehi, a wonderfully Christ-centered school, what's underneath your heart and spirit just now? Is there a personal confession? And that comes back to this question that a number of you raised about being raised in a Christian environment or school or church or family. The other way to argue that would be to say that's actually such a precious gift, isn't it? rather than a detriment. But this point gets to your question, yes, you are right. Those of you who posed it are so right. It must become personal. The faith of the Bible, the faith of Jesus is meant to be my Lord, not my Father's Christ. My God not my church's God. Personal. And you're so right. You're going to have to investigate, as did Thomas, to come to that place where, like Thomas, there is an incredible change. The doubter, the questioner, ends up erupting in one of the highest Christological affirmations in all the Bible. So simple, my Lord, my God, Jesus. So dear young men, young women, all faculty, staff as well, I so hope that the Chehi Summer School of Music leads you into the reality of such a personal confession. 
Jesus Christ takes up his proper estimation in your life. My, my Lord, my, my God. But it also affirms two absolutely critical Christological realities. Jesus is Lord, the authority above all, in your life as well as in, in all of creation. Jesus is God, authoritative precisely because he is divine in your life, not in dogma, not in affirmations written in a creed, but in your life. My God, the great God above all gods, Jesus himself. I remember in my early years at Chehi Summer School, I was just a little bit, wee bit older after two or three initial years. I had come to somewhat kind of a peer relationship with Wilmus Chehi, the founder of this school, Wilmus Chehi. And on that kind of terms, I remember asking him why did he have such a passion to start the Chehi Summer School of Music? He said, well, it is because I love young people and I love great music and I love God. Just personal, so personal. I love teenagers. I love the best music, and I love Jesus. That's why this place exists. I offer you the biblical welcome, the biblical welcome like John's Gospel and Thomas to question, doubt, humble skepticism, fears unmasked. And I hope like Thomas, like Tommy's Anglican Church in London, it leads you to say this to Jesus Christ, my Lord, my God, as you get to know this Jesus, as we consider Jesus again. Lord, thank you so much for Wilmus Chehi. Thank you for his vision that is quite simple. Love of young men and women. Love of the highest quality of music. And underlying it all, Wilmus's deep love for Jesus. Help us learn in that spirit today. Amen.